What's up motivators, Taryn here. The benefits of going into a sauna several times a week have been documented all over the place over the last few years. So when we started building the setup for our home on Vancouver Island, I wanted to make sure that we had a sauna. Fact of the matter is that with the cost of everything over the last few years, sauna kits have skyrocketed up to eight, nine thousand dollars and pre-built saunas getting upwards of twelve thousand dollars. So we built this barrel sauna for under three thousand dollars using very basic tools and about 40 hours of work. We're going to walk through everything that we did to do that and how you can do it yourself. My name is Taryn Gazelle. In my 20s I was overweight, unfulfilled and couldn't even run to the end of the block. Over the following years, I found endurance sports, lost 65 pounds, won age groups, raced world championships, broke records, and trained and learned from some of the best athletes and coaches in the world. You too can use endurance sports to change your life and accomplish your fitness goals. You just need a system. A system that's meant for us amateurs who want to be our best while feeling our strongest and healthiest. My company Motive offers that system and I want to share some of the tips from it today. All right, let's give you some specs on this. The barrel sauna that we've created is six feet high. It's six feet long, six feet in diameter. Comfortably, four people get in this. It's a little bit cozy in there, but totally perfect. We've got the sauna up to a little over 200 degrees Fahrenheit. It's fired by a wood stove, so you do need to have access to firewood but I really like that because it allows for this nice analog experience. We spend so much time on our phones and on laptops throughout the day that I wanted to have something that actually required a little bit of work with stacking the wood, cutting the wood, transporting the wood, getting the fire going and then waiting an hour and having that experience of just calming yourself down before even getting into the sauna is part of the experience of the sauna. So with that said, now that you know the specs, let's get into how to build this. So the first thing to do is find a lumber mill and we got 43 12 foot lengths that were six inch by 12 feet long by one inch thick. Now you can go with one and a half inch and that's actually what I would recommend. The lumber mill that we dealt with, they had an awesome deal on one inch thick, already planed material that was just like rock bottom prices. So we went with that and they said that quite a number of people actually use that one inch for barrel saunas. So we went with the one inch and like I said, we've got the sauna up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's not like we're really losing out on a whole lot of insulation. The barrel aspect of it with the curved tops and the curve along the bottom, this is what actually keeps the heat in without having to have a whole bunch of insulation and really thick boards. And when you get material, try to get it as close to finished as possible. This is described as S4S. This is finished four sides, straight four sides. And then even an eased edge will help because that's going to reduce a lot of the work that you'll need to do the milling of this. And it's all that work that you'll save will be well worth the price of getting it from the mill. So the first step is that you'll notice that every single plank fits into each other. Now, they're not exactly tight because wood expands and contracts, but to get everything as tight as possible, you need to put a curve on one edge and then the opposite curve on another. So that each piece can fit into the very next piece in a fairly tight fashion. To do that, I purchased a cove router bit for one edge and then the opposing cove for the other edge. I'll put links in the description below to all the products that we had. Some will be affiliate links, but most won't be. I got that from Lee Valley and those bits that I'm going to link in the description below allow you to do just one pass as opposed to doing a pass on one edge, a pass on the other edge, and then two passes on the other side by being able to do just one pass the whole way through that's going to save you a whole lot of time. So we went through all 43 12 foot lengths and cut them down the middle. We didn't fuss about them being all exactly the exact same length, but roughly in the middle. And that allowed us to then work with six foot lengths, which were easier to pass through the router. And we put 
the edge on each side. The final bit of milling that we had to do was to create a groove in all of the slats that were going to go around the barrel sauna. Because the way that this works is these slats fit into each other and then they also sit down on top of the gables. So remember when I said that we didn't worry about cutting these exactly to the exact same length? That would be a tremendous amount of work to get that down to the 32nd of an inch. So we wanted to make it so that we could very, very quickly cut that groove. So to do that, we created a jig where we put a whole bunch of these pieces into each other and then tightened everything up so they wouldn't move side by side. And then we created a stop for the router on both ends so that the distance between the grooves on the front side and the back side was always going to be exactly the same distance. It's always exactly the same distance from here to the groove on the other side, which allows us to just snap this into place without having to do every single board one at a time measuring every time. I've seen people do videos on this on YouTube where they spend days doing all the milling. We spent only about seven or eight hours doing all the milling because we just used a lot of jigs and simplified ways of doing it. Once we had that, we needed to make these gable walls. So these gable walls were just more of those six foot pieces that we took and we started stacking each tightly to each other, taking a block and pounding it on one edge while we had the other edge mounted up against a piece of wood that was going to stop it from moving that way and we just keep tapping the blocks until this became tighter and tighter and tighter. Once everything was tight enough we took a strap of just western yellow cedar and put it across the top and then made these cross members in this fashion so that it's stable on the top, stable on the bottom, stable in the middle and then stable going across. We did that on both sides, on the back wall and the front wall was just a little bit different. We can zoom around and show you that. And it's that little bit different because we had to leave room for the door in the middle. So we just had to have some cross members that were going to keep the door stable when we cut out the door. After we had both the back and the front gables completely put together and solid, I used a skill saw just to plunge cut this center door here and we made sure that the top cut and the side cut was done in such a manner that the brace at the top was half on the door, half on the gable on both the top and the bottom. So that made sure that the door frame is going to be stable on the gable and then the door itself is going to be stable amongst itself. So we have this all screwed in at the top, this all screwed in here, and then cross members going that way to keep the door stable. The final thing that we had to build was the cradle, the three pieces here that this sits in. You can go and buy a five inch piece of wood that is 12 inches high, but those are really, really expensive, especially now, and they're tougher to find. So what I used instead was just three pieces of two by 10 and I cut these just a little bit narrower than the actual width of the sauna. And then I used the same method that we used for the curve of cutting those gables out that I did for cutting out how the sauna is going to sit in this. I spaced the two pieces one thickness apart. So we have four and a half inches of stability for each cradle. Once doing that, we had all the pieces that we needed for the sauna and the cradle itself. So I came in here and we leveled out the site, making all these pads level from front to back, level from side to side, and then put the cradle in. Now that we have the cradle down, all we had to do was just start putting in the slats. And what we did to put in the slats was Start with one slat and the slat at the bottom is measured and you spend a lot of time making sure that the distance from this edge of the slat to the edge of the cradle at the back 
is the same on the front slat as it is at the middle slat as it is at the back slat. That's gonna make sure that it is level and it's straight so that as we go around, every single board is also straight and level. So we start with one and then we go to the next and the next, gradually tapping everything in and as we were tapping them in, we would go about three boards and put a screw down, and then another three boards and put a screw down, another three boards and put a screw down. Once we got this little basic cradle here, sort of filled in this, this bottom section, then we put in the front and back gables so that all the rest of the slats could actually start fitting into that. That's how we get all of the slats all the way around. And then you just keep following that all the way around to the top, tapping everything in, and I guarantee you're going to have some frustrating moments where you tap some in and then other things come out of place because this is wood, wood is imperfect. Wood warps, wood changes, wood expands and contracts, wood is not perfectly dead straight, so a lot of things are going to change. Once you get to the top, what you'll see is to make the top tight, you'll need to split one piece down the middle pound it in to one edge and then the other side into the other edge and then create a wedge in the middle that you pound down. You can see that even just in matter of 14 to 10 days roughly, we've had a fair bit of expanding and contracting and still just two days ago, even with that expanding and contracting, we got it up to 200 degrees. So you pound that wedge down and it's going to be about as tight as you can expect. Once we had it all together, I put a coat of stain on it just to seal it. Because it's Western Red Cedar, we want that nice smell. We don't want it turning gray. And well, Western Red Cedar, it turns gray like our fence post here, like that. So we've got this stain on here and that's going to keep it from getting gray. We also don't want to rely on all those screws that we used for all the slats as we were going around the barrel. The reason for that is we want this to be able to expand and contract so that things don't crack. Wood needs to be able to expand and contract as humidity goes up and down. This is something that it, the humidity is going to change a lot. So how we keep it nice and stable is with these come-alongs. You can use a steel strap, but you need to know a little bit about how to use steel strapping. But these come-alongs are just a very good way to quickly get everything nice and tight. So I went around the barrel, got it fairly tight, then took out a whole bunch of the screws, left in the screws in the areas that I knew the boards were a little bit loose and I didn't want to risk everything falling apart, and then tightened everything up to the point that the entire barrel is basically kept tight by itself. The entire structure of the barrel isn't going anywhere because all these straps are keeping it in place and then everything is grooved into itself. So it's not going anywhere. You don't have to put a top on this, but I want to put a top on this because like I said, nothing is airtight in this. You want this to be able to breathe. You want this to be able to move. So a lot of very traditional barrel saunas, they just have the top open. And in a lot of those cases, when it rains outside, where on Vancouver Island, we get a lot of rain throughout the winter, it would be raining inside the barrel sauna. I don't want it to be musty. I don't want it to have mold build up inside. So I just used some corrugated metal that I screwed down. It was three pieces of six foot long corrugated metal that we wrapped around the top. And that keeps the rain from getting in in a big way. Water finds a way in, but again, this isn't perfect. This isn't about making something that is airtight. It is about making something that is not going to be moldy, not going to be mildewy, that functions really well, that is safe for a decent price. And this is a great way to do that. Just make sure that you use roofing metal screws that have a rubber grommet on it so that water doesn't get into all those holes there, getting in between this sheet metal and the actual barrel sauna itself. Moving inside, once we had the barrel built and the roofing done, we had to make the inside functional because you need to stand in here, you need to be able to sit in here. If we were to just stand on all of the planks of the outside of the sauna, we would have everything popping out because you're putting a lot of weight into specific areas. Even though it's sitting into the cradle, you want to disperse the weight with where you're standing. 
So I made this bottom, which is just a little bit wider than the door by cutting another arc with that same method that we used with the circular saw to cut the bottom and give us a plank to actually screw things down on. So I had one, two, three, four, five of those curves spread from front to back. And then I just screwed down boards into that. So that's nice and stable, nice and flat. And as you're standing on, it's dispersing the weight across all of the slats here. Then we've got to make the seats. Seats are very easy. Just made a rectangle that is made from half the width of each of the boards. So I just ripped a bunch of boards down the middle and then screwed it into the back and the front and then created these posts here to actually take some of the weight from sitting on that. Screwed a little bit into the back, but make sure that you don't screw through the actual boards. And then I put these planks on top for us to sit on. Now let's talk about the window. How do we actually get this window into the door? Well, remember how I said that we cut this out once this is cut out, the door's already there for you. It's just waiting to be hung. So hang the door and from any hardware store, you can get these spring-loaded screws. And I wanna use spring-loaded screws so that quickly, even if somebody doesn't think about closing the door behind them, the door closes on itself. So these are very, very basic, very inexpensive. And then I use the skill saw again to plunge cut this window shape here and I went to any local glass place. This cost I think 45 bucks and gave them the measurements, getting around in the corners because we used the router to set this in so that it could be just a little bit bigger than the space that we cut. And then I just siliconed it in with heat resistant silicone. When you're getting this window, make sure you're getting either a tempered glass or a safety glass so that if this breaks for any reason, like it's getting to be too hot and it shatters, it's not gonna shatter and create things that will cut you. Safety glass is really nice because it shatters and everything just stays in place because it's all just stuck there to a film that's in the middle. Then once that's done, screw it all in, add a little stopper here to stop it from swinging in and then breaking the hinges. So that little stopper is going to stop the hinges from over closing. And then the fun part happens. We start putting in the wood stove. So like I said, I went with a wood stove over an electric stove because I wanted this to be a lot more analog. I love that crackling feeling. I love the smell of wood. I love the ceremony of starting a little fire and making a little bit, bit bigger and having something to tend to and gradually building it up. It, forces me to have a process that is taking me away from looking at my phone or looking at a laptop. So I wanted a wood stove and it has air intake here, has the door on the front, had a hole in the top for all the venting and the legs. And then when it came time to install it, went and got some cement board to put some cement board on the back, cement board on the bottom cement board on the front of the combustibles of the seats and the supports for the seats because you want as few combustibles within six inches as possible. We're actually going to still put some cement board on the back here all the way up to the top in behind the pipe but that cement board is going to make it a little bit safer. It'll stop everything from getting singed and burnt. Also originally we had planned to come up with the chimney and then out the back. We got some advice from the local chimney people that said when you're burning wood, you don't want to have a horizontal pipe because creosote will build up at the top of that horizontal pipe. And creosote is what can cause a chimney fire that can ignite. So they suggested just going up through the roof. Going up through the roof then causes the problem of well, what do we do for stopping rain? Well, again, remember, this isn't meant to be watertight or airtight. So what we created was this thimble that the chimney passes through. So we have a five to six inch adapter here at the bottom because it's a five inch hole 
at the top of the wood stove, up to six inch pipe. The six inch pipe goes through the thimble. And then here we have a collar because it's six inch pipe that is also surrounded by seven inch pipe as it goes through the thimble. So we have air on the edge of the seven inch pipe passing through the thimble and then air even between the seven inch pipe and the six inch pipe going through the roof. Once you've got the pipe through, we put a top cap on to stop rain from going down into the wood stove. And then to make it as watertight as possible, we have this flashing. What you'll request is a steel roof flashing that allows you to cut out what you need, all the notches for the rivets and the bumps in the steel roof. And then you can just take steel screws, screw it down and it will bend around the curve of a barrel sauna. And then to make everything watertight all around the edges, start putting some aluminum tape around here, put aluminum tape all around the edges. And that's going to, we've actually got water here building up. So that is actually watertight and serving its purpose, stopping everything from just coming into the barrel sauna and being inside. And to finish everything off, make it really nice. We got these hooks on Amazon that we can hang a robe, a towel on. I highly recommend putting your towel on the opening side of the door. So if you're in here by yourself and it's getting super hot, you can just lean out and crack the door by this much and bring the towel in. And then there were a couple of accessories that we had inside that made it really nice. This is about a 18 or $20 pillow that goes on the back and gives you something to lean against on the back. We got the ladle and the bucket for putting water on the rocks. We got the rocks also from Amazon. Don't just go and get any rocks. These have to be specific rocks for a sauna. A lot of people will go and get lava rocks and everything will just start cracking and exploding in your face when it heats up. So you need specific rocks. And then to monitor everything, we've got this little timer here that you flip over and the sand will come down and let you know when it's been five, 10, 15 minutes. And then we have the thermometer and the hygrometer to tell us what the humidity is in here. So the total build price, we're looking at around $3,000. Total time, probably around 35 to 40 hours. Looking back on it, I don't really know how much I would change. Building something that is $3,000 that will probably last seven to 10 years, be totally safe, totally usable, heats up like crazy, it's great. We've been in this quite a bit over the last week and a half since it's got totally completed and we're thrilled with how it works. So if you're interested in saving yourself six, seven, eight, nine thousand dollars $9,000, hopefully this helps. There's a list to everything in the description below. If you need any questions answered, DM me on Instagram and I'll try to help. Thank you for watching Motivators. If you're looking for a training plan that incorporates these methods that is as good as a one-on-one -on -one coach, but as inexpensive as doing it yourself, check out our Motive training app that covers triathlons, running races, duathlons, swim runs, and cycling events. It's a link in the description below where you can check out your customized training plan for free. Also, if you rather listen to these tips, we also publish these videos in podcast format on the Terran's Motive Method podcast, so you can check that out. And if you don't wanna do either of those things, but you found this video helpful, hit us up with a virtual high five by smashing the like button below. Later, motivators.